So welcome to the last talk by Dr. Shankar. He's uh, very well known in the formal method community. He's co-developed um, a PVS system, which many of my students are actually using it. Um, he also developed a cell uh, model checker, SMT solver. He's a distinguished senior scientist at the Stanford Research Institute. He's also a SRI fellow. Uh, won the CAV Award 2012, many other awards. So, Shankar, please. It's always a pleasure to be in Singapore, and especially a uh, pleasure to be uh, at NUS and visit uh, a number of uh, old friends. I'm really grateful uh, to the organizers for this uh, invitation and the opportunity to uh, speak to you. My name is uh, Natarajan Shankar, and uh, part of what I'll be presenting is uh, from derived from a project called Dessert Design for Certification, uh, done with uh, partners from uh, Honeywell Research as well as University of Washington, uh, Professor Michael Ernst's group out there. Uh, and uh, you know, I work at SRI International. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of SRI. So, okay, not a lot, but uh, the, uh, um, you know, just as a brief introduction to SRI, there's a number of, uh, technologies that you probably use every day that uh, come from there. These include, for example, the modern user interface with Windows, hypertext, the mouse, and so on. That comes from SRI. The uh, way the checks appear and checks are processed, the automated thing was actually a project called IRMA that was done at SRI. Uh, SWOT analysis, uh, Siri, if you use Siri, that's from SRI as well, hence the name. Um, and and uh, many other kind of totally uh, ubiquitous uh, technologies. I'm, un I'm only scratching the surface. There's hundreds of things like this that uh, uh, one could go on. One really interesting one that I came across recently is actually warning about climate change. So SRI was warning about climate change in the late 1940s. It was founded in 1946. And already one of the earliest things they did is actually give these very, very dire warnings about cl climate change in the 40s and, and in the 50s, way before anybody else who's actually attributed with the, with the warnings like James Allen and so on. The, the, uh, these warnings were actually buried by the fossil fuel industry. Okay, so that's briefly a, a bit about uh, SRI. So the talk I'm giving today is really from uh, 30,000 feet. It's, it's actually one of the telescope type talks. It's not the microscope one, it's, it's, a, it's a telescope talk. And this is not usual for me. I'm, I'm usually someone in the, in the weeds. I don't really, uh, uh, I don't actually even get the big picture. I don't worry about the big picture. But there are things that I notice in, in passing over many decades that I'm waiting for somebody else to speak up about. And I've been waiting, and I've been waiting, and I've been waiting. And there's you know, really nobody uh, saying the, the things that I think ought to have been said. And uh, you know, if, if you think these have been said, then you know, b b feel free to uh, participate in the discussion. I, I want this to be completely interactive. I, I'll be spewing out a, a series of uh, controversial observations. If uh, you disagree with it, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in your viewpoint. Um, the, uh, you're probably the kind of person I'm reacting to anyway. Okay, <laughs> so, so it, it's fine, and I, wa I want to engage with you on this. And uh, part of what I want to point out is that these old problems have not gone away. You know, just because there's some newfangled technology that uh, you know, occupies the headlines doesn't, doesn't really mean that the stuff that's not occupying the headlines can be neglected. It's, it's very much there. It's very much the elephant in the room. It definitely needs your attention. Uh, if you go chasing new shiny objects, well and good, but the uh, old uh, dull stuff actually uh, still needs to be solved. And there are actually a lot of exciting research opportunities here. I'd like you to uh, pick up on these. Okay, the first thing I have to observe is that the, one of the greatest uh, engineering achievements of humankind is the modern software stack. There's no question that this is a, a truly miraculous achievement that we can do these amazing things with just a few keystrokes, that enormous power gets unleashed with, with just a few keystrokes thanks to things going up and down this uh, software stack. 
the layers of abstraction that have been built, the, the uh, sheer amount of engineering man hours or person hours that have gone into this is, is staggering. And this is truly something that I think we can be proud of. The, the fact that even as hardware has evolved, as application, uh, applications have changed, as new technologies have been integrated, you know, all of this stuff is, is actually uh, give, delivering services that are truly uh, valuable and uh, life-saving in many cases. But there's, there's kind of a dark side to this as well. As we've expanded the range of things that we've done with software, the uh, attack surface has also grown. And you've had a number of talks about this already, showing that the attacks really come from very surprising places. But the consequences of these attacks, the, the kinds of uh, damage that can be unleashed by these attacks has also grown. As we put more and more trust in this technology, as we you know, put our medical records, our bank data, our educational accomplishments, uh, all of these things now uh, start to become vulnerable. And we've reached a point where we're really treating what's managed by software as, as the ground truth. And if this gets corrupted or damaged or tarnished, then there, there is a kind of loss of uh, trust that we as a society have come to depend on. People may not realize what the cost of this is. You, you, if you don't pay attention to this, you, you may not know what the cost of these vulnerabilities actually turns out to be. So software bugs alone, that's the engineering cost of software bugs, and that's partly because the engineering of software is done so badly, is around $2.41 trillion a year. That's trillion with a T. I, I don't know what the GDP of Singapore is, but I'm sure it's not that much. Okay. This, is, you know, this is the GDP of a major country, okay, $2.41 trillion. And I'm sure it's a severe underestimate. Okay, that this, this is a, a serious underestimate of the actual cost. Cybercrime is a six trillion a year problem that uh, is, is, again, trillion with a T. And partly why it's an under, under approximation is that we don't measure the annoyance that bad software imposes on us. I tell people that you know, when I use the, you know, something or the other, a laptop, I notice a bug at, on the average every 30 seconds. And I'm I'm one of the more oblivious people, okay? I, I overlook a lot of stuff. If I were actually paying attention, there's probably a bug every five seconds. And there's things that you know, I don't do because I don't trust this stuff. There, there's opportunity costs that are not factored into this. So I, I hope you really do understand the cost of this, that there's virtually every other problem known to mankind could be solved if you could save money out here. Okay, okay that, that's the, the kind of uh, scale of the problem. Now, this is not an easy problem. Part of the reason is software is not like many other engineered artifacts. Software is just malleable, it's flexible. You can do all kinds of things. You can layer functionality upon functionality. You can create you know, complex layers of abstraction with software. These are things that you cannot do with civil engineering or mechanical engineering or chemical engineering and so on. So software is genuinely different. The uh, other thing that uh, you know, the, the, we expect quite a lot out of, out of software, we, we expect not just functionality, we expect it to be resilient, we expect it to be persistent, we expect it to be uh, maintainable and you know, all kinds of uh, illities that we impose on software. And, and this, again, leads to the engineering complexity uh, of software being quite formidable. So the, the other thing that's strange about software is that you know, there's no kind of wear and tear, or, or you, know, you, you don't notice things kind of, there's no early warning signal saying that something is breaking. It can just unexpectedly break, and even the tiniest bug can actually cause uh, uh, a serious consequence. I've, I've uh, put a list of celebrity bugs on, on that side. Uh, and for example, the Patriot missile bug was exactly the kind of uh, floating point problem that Olya was talking about. That is, point one is actually not represented that well. Decimal point one 
is not represented that well in floating point. And if you have a calculation where the errors accumulate, then you, you do have something like the Patriot missile bug. Okay, so something as trivial as that can, can cause a, a, a huge problem. Uh, so that's another thing about software. Then software applications tend to be one of a kind. Each one is different from the other. This means really that there's not a whole lot you can say about developing software in a principled manner that is universal. A lot of software really depends on the domain. It depends on the context. It depends on the threat model. It depends on the hardware. So there's a, a lot going on out there. So it's, it's really hard to say anything in, in general. This is why you know, in, in software engineering, we really haven't been able to have a huge impact. Okay, that, there's not a lot you can really say about software that's generic. And, and of course, the attackers, again, as Olya said, they only have to succeed once. Okay, you, you have to defend all the time. So they, they can you know, find one vulnerability and, and drive a truck through it and cause damage at a, at, a, at, a, at a global scale. So the thing that's important then about software is that we can provide some manifest way of creating trust within it before it's even deployed. Okay, that's, that's the point that we need to reach with, with software. It's, it's something where you can, you can say that the, you know, without actually deploying the system, you can say exactly how it will work. Okay? And that comes in, in the form of something that's composable assurance. That's not how we do it these days. These days we tend to kind of react to uh, the uh, damage that occurs. You, you see a, a, a cyber attack and then you react to it. And what you get then with, with this approach of, of uh, placing patches and band-aids and, and so on is you're, one, triggering an arms race to the bottom. Okay. And remember, the, the one thing you need to know about any kind of race to the bottom is that you cannot win. Okay. And that's what is happening. You're not winning. The other thing is that those band-aids actually turn out to be very convenient one-stop shops for the attackers. This is why, actually, I don't have the solar winds out there. But the solar winds and so on, these, these are things where there's kind of a one-stop shop. All you have to do is find something that you know, is trying to protect your system in some misguided way. And that, attacking that thing, will give you complete control of the system. Okay. I have a bunch of some spyware running on my machine because my employers insist on it, because their funding agents insist on it. That's the thing that I'm terrified about. Okay, that's the, the, the stuff that's pretending to protect me is the thing that I'm, I'm sure the attackers will find the, the, uh, a one-stop shop for actually launching attacks. OK, so what can go wrong with uh, software? So the, the uh, things we expect out of software are quite demanding. We expect, uh, as I mentioned, a whole range of uh, illities. And we expect the software to also work under a whole range of conditions. I remember when we were first developing PVS, uh, my uh, manager, uh, John Rushby, would come up with these bug reports that I think, there's, there's only one way you could have come up with a bug like that, and that's by sitting on the keyboard. Okay? <laughs> and uh, that's, I, mean, I don't think he did that, but you know, I think he would just type some random things and say, look, it, it, didn't, it didn't work. Okay? That's, that's kind of the... Uh, Attack, but there's kind of all kinds of surprising ways you, that things can go wrong, and it's often only after the fact that you realize, well, I guess I didn't pay attention to that particular uh, uh, combination of uh, events. And so, for things to be safe, you have to be able to make sure that you've protected the software against all possible hazards, all possible conditions that are that are undesirable. And often the, these hazards are triggered by some kind of failure in the software. The, the software deviates from its intended behavior. And, and that deviation might be uh, due to some actual error in the software. For example, you might, you might have missed a particular check. You might have uh, uh, allowed some bad input to reach a sensitive operation and so on. So, so th those are the kinds of 
design errors or coding errors that might have led to a, a, a fault that then triggered a, a, a failure. Okay, so the, uh, the, the other part of this is that there can be many, many sources of, of software failure. In the, in the previous slide, I talked about the cost overruns. This is another big issue with software, is that we've not been able to estimate how much it will actually cost to, to uh, create, create a certain piece of software. And part of this is, again, the lack of a discipline. We don't know, you know anything ge generic about software. So things like the advanced automation system, the, the, I mean, we can, after the fact, explain what went wrong there with healthcare.gov. Uh, also with uh, Obamacare, we can explain what went wrong. But the cost of the damage runs into billions. So in, one, one of the things I put in here is uh, inept management, which I often uh, indicate that you don't really need uh, the inept there is redundant. You can just say management, and uh, that's, that's good enough. The, uh, uh, this is, again, a, a quite a difficult task. We don't have a science of how to manage software projects either. OK, the risks associated with software, I've, I've collected a, a few here with some examples, run all the way from hardware down to social engineering. So th there are things that can go wrong with, with hardware. You, you had the Intel F dev floating point uh, bug that cost Intel actually, I think, something like uh, half a billion dollars uh, in, in a write-off. Uh, Spectre and Meltdown, again, you know, we all learned uh, speculative execution and never thought anything uh, suspicious, there was anything suspicious about it. But the, uh, someone looking at it uh, with, a, with a new pair of glasses uh, finds that hey, there must be something uh, where one can launch an attack through speculative execution and they're able to do that. So the, the side channels, again, are a, a common source of uh, information leakage. You have calculation errors, things like the Mars Polar Lander. Some of these even happen because they got the dimensions mixed up, they, uh, whether it's uh, inches versus centimeters. So the, there are bugs like that. The Ariane 5 error was actually a, a, a numeric overflow error for a value that actually had no consequence. But because they thought there were no, that the software couldn't fail, something must be wrong with the hardware. And they scuttled a flight that could have gone on perfectly normally a launch that could have gone on perfectly normally. So memory and type safety are a source of uh, uh, risk in, in, in software. The lack of input validation, race conditions, the uh, ability to inject or reuse code, so things like uh, the uh, return-oriented programming. So even you know, with the protections put in there. And uh, you know, the, the, all the way down to uh, Backdoors that were inserted. Uh, you know, uh, there's also the uh, Sony Pictures hack, for instance, and uh, so on. So these are these are things where uh, there's a, there's a community of researchers who takes a delight in uh, pointing these out. And uh, uh, the the unfortunate thing is, it's it's easy to find these problems. It's much harder to prevent them. So. This is uh, the, the kind of Pogo uh, cartoon from uh, 1970, I think, the first Earth Day. So uh, Pogo and his friend are uh, um, walking in the forest. The, uh, and, and they find the forest has got a lot of junk strewn at it, and the uh, you know, beauty of the for forest primeval gets me in the heart. And you know, uh, Pogo says, uh, it gets me in the feet. It's hard walking on this stuff. Yup, son, we met the enemy and he is us. Okay, we are the problem. And actually, we're the problem in, in many, many other ways also, not just in, in software-related risks. By the way, that's a shout-out to my colleague Peter Neumann out there. He's been warning about this. He's been kind of the uh, um, cyber Paul Revere for decades, since the 60s. And he, he's been argue, arguing for building security from the ground up. And unfortunately, the rest of the world has not taken him as seriously as it should have. OK, so what can we do about it constructively uh, at this point? One issue is that a lot of what we're dealing with in the software stack is that it's kind of uh, studded with what I call original sins design decisions that were taken in ex extraordinarily innocent times that don't make sense in the modern world. 
a lot of these things that seem to be taught to generations of students as gospel truth are truly dreadful design decisions, yet they're taught as if this is the way it should be done. It's not. I mean, these are things that really should be cleansed from the system. So things like conflating the call and variable stack, I, I can't imagine why it was a good idea even in the first place. But OK, you know, given that people wanted, say, one stack, for whatever reason, maybe saving a register or something like that, it, it does not give you a way of protecting against data affecting control in an illegal way. Okay. But if you separate it out, you get what I call an efficient argument, and I'll be saying quite a lot about efficient arguments, for how data can only affect control in legal ways. It can only affect it through like if-then-elses. Okay. That's the only way it can affect control. And, and there's many things like this. If you, if you start to think about it, just what every design decision that you take for granted is probably an original sin. It, it shouldn't be done that way. Okay? It, you shouldn't be using threads. You know, that's not the abstraction you should give the programmer. Um, you, you, should, you, know, you have really poor file and network abstractions. A uh, lot, lot of the, the way protections are done, all of these things, is just filled with... Uh, even, you know, why did the specter and meltdown happen? Why wasn't the cache protected? Okay, that, that seems really weird. That, that's, that's how a lot of uh, hardware was actually built. Okay, so this uh, original sense is a problem. Now, you might think, coming from where I stand, that I would tell you that, you know, you should formally verify everything. But that's not my point at all. The, the, uh, you, can, you can formally verify terrible designs. You can formally verify something, and it still might not work. Actually, a good recent example is the CompCert compiler. It was formally verified. It's a C compiler that was formally verified. So a year ago, uh, actually, my uh, former intern, David Monu, published a paper with his colleagues in which they said, you know, we tested CompCert, and it was full of bugs. And you might think, OK, how did that happen? How is it that something that was formally verified have bugs in it? It's because they, they were assumptions that were not true. And there were other people who found bugs in CompCert as well. But you know, these are all correct relative to some models, some relative to some assumptions. And those could be flawed. So I would regard formal modeling and analysis as both feasible and necessary, but not sufficient. Okay? So, so that's my editorial view, opinion on this. So the, the main thing here is that what we need, please, yeah? No. No, so the, the initially there were some bugs in the front end parsing, yeah, yeah. but there, there were plenty of bugs in the actual compiler, yeah. Uh, so David Monier's paper is what you should uh, look up on this. Um, I mean, it does point out that you do need to test stuff as well because you can get your assumptions wrong. Um, so the, the important point that you should take away from this is that you're not just designing the artifact. You're designing the assurance argument that goes with the artifact. That's the object of your design. You should think in terms of what could possibly go wrong and why you protect it against those things possibly going wrong. And, and that, that's, that's what good software design is about. The efficiency of this assurance argument is important. Oddly, I advocate a, a, a design um, that if there was something wrong with it, there would be something obviously wrong with it. That is, for a skeptic to figure out what the flaw is, is easy. That is, an efficient argument, a design based on an efficient argument is one whose flaws would be magnified. Okay, that is, the falsification space is large. I'll, I'll come to some examples of this, but a, a simple example would be using, for example, a type-safe and memory-safe language. If type safety or memory safety failed for that language, that would be a big flaw. But once you have that, you, know, you, you get the type safety and memory safety of execution. Okay, does, 
that, that, that example make any sense? OK. So uh, using a, a separation kernel is a much better, more efficient argument than arguing that if you actually examine every line of every program, you'll see that they don't interfere in, in, in any bad way. Okay? That would be a completely inefficient way to, because th that imposes the burden on, on the evaluator or the skeptic to then come up with why this might fail. Whereas with an, in an efficient argument, you've actually made the game easy for the skeptic. And you've given the skeptic all the weapons to destroy you, and you still win. Okay, that's what you want in an efficient argument. Okay. So another thing that's really important is the, the architecture that you build, the software around. So people often think that they've solved software composition by giving an operator with two vertical bars. I find that those two vertical bars are really use, useless. That's not the, the point. The, those generic composition operators are not what you need. You, you need custom composition operators. So you need, you need a model of computation and interaction to, to give you strong guarantees. And by embedding more and more properties into the architecture, you, you protect against bad software components. You also provide arguments that are reusable so that the argument is efficient now because the amortized cost of assuring it is, is less. You expect compilers to be reused, architectures to be reused, code generators to be reused, and so on. So, so that's important. I'll give an example of something like this. And the other thing that you need to kind of secure is the workflow by which the software is created. There should be no gaps. The, what you assure should be what you build. Okay, so the assurance and build process have to be integrated. OK, any questions at this point? No arguments? You don't object to anything I'm saying? Yeah, the, uh, uh, one of the reasons software fails is optimizing too early. Okay, that's actually a, a source of problems. People, uh, uh, and the, nothing in this approach actually mitigates against efficiency of the, perform uh, the performance. The uh, making uh, efficient performance your objective at the cost of assurance is very dangerous. Okay, that's, that's really, uh, uh, again, a, a race to the bottom because then people will just provide crypto algorithms that are fast and unreliable, for instance. Yes, uh, thanks uh, Shankar for this presentation. Good so week. I don't have much arguments with what you presented, mm -hmm. but I feel you have left out something which causes a significant amount of unreliability. Mm -hmm. And that's because a lot of the software that we use is often written by people who are not very well trained in computer science. They don't have a computer science degree. They may be long sit on the job. And as a result, they don't engineer. So, this, uh, so I would just like to add uh, into the agenda, which is something I have noticed. I agree, yeah. People with computer science degrees typically have a lot of opportunity to live on into other positions. But people who are eventually doing the programming for the software that you use is somebody who may not be very well trained in the engineering. Yeah, and, and quite often, you know, the software is written by domain experts yes. who are not well trained in all the ways that software can mess things up. Right. So that, that's so true I, too. I would just like to bring Absolutely, yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I I won't say it's a good question. I'll say I'll tell you when it's a terrible question. Okay, <laughs> but this is a, a, a truly valid point: is that uh, you know, software is just written by just about anybody. There's no real licensing mechanism. There's no um, you know, liability mechanism. It comes with no warranties. The uh, 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 you know the the uh, whole thing is is kind of unregulated in 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 some ways. The lack of yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know the the thing that. Uh, happens with regulation 
especially when you regulate too late, is that one, uh, I assume everyone here knows what CYA is, okay? So I won't bother to expand the acronym, but um, it becomes an exercise in CYA. That is, the regulations are there just so that you can say, cover your tracks, okay? <laughs> But there's a second point, which is that um, it can lead to what's called regulatory capture. So, you know, if I have more lawyers than you, then I can, I can manipulate the regulations and get, get through them. You, as a, you know, a, a smaller player, perhaps, will not be able to get past the regulations. Yeah, so uh, these, again, I, I told you this is a hard problem, and that's actually an example of where things get tricky. It doesn't mean there aren't good compromises. I mean, for example, if they would actually masked the uh, cash accesses, for instance, then only y the offending program gets uh, damaged by it. And that's a good thing, because if... No, no, that, that, that would be going too far, I agree. Yeah, that, that you, do, you do need that. But it doesn't have to come at the cost of uh, uh, the, uh, protecting other people's uh, running programs as well. So th there are simple solutions to this. I, I, I don't think it's, a, it's a, as simple a, a trade-off as you just have to turn off speculation. I think there are better compromises. They, they do come at some minor cost, but it's definitely a, a cost worth paying. So, so that's something that I think, uh, again, uh, I mean, you, you don't want to design hardware that's insecure by design or unreliable by design. That's something that you just don't want to do, uh, if, even if it gives you speed. Okay, so, but, uh, yeah, good question. Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, this is a situation where I think the regulation is, is timely in some ways. But, you know, if you look at, for example, social media and so on, that horse has already left the barn. Yeah. But in, in many domains, the, the regulations just say you should sprinkle holy water on things. And that's just a way of uh, protecting yourself against uh, liability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah, good. So, okay, the, the, uh, let me talk about design and uh, efficient argument-based design. Uh, and the motivating example for this is uh, a, a crash that took place in 2006 uh, in Afghanistan of a plane called the Nimrod uh, RAF British uh, plane that had been flying since 1969. It had uh, been uh, upgraded in the 90s with mid-air refueling. And within 90 seconds of an actual mid-air refueling, with a you know, air-to-air refueling, it caught fire and all 16 people on board died. So the uh, cause of the fire was that the uh, refueling uh, uh, point uh, was, was actually close to a, a heat sink. And uh, that 
combination of fuel and uh, the heat sink with, with actually frayed insulation meant that the fuel caught fire. This was in a place where the fuel was just sloshing around after the refueling. And uh, so, so that was the, was the uh, attributed to be the cause of the fire. Actually, there, there are differing interpretations of this. It wasn't clear whether it, it was because the insulin was soaked in uh, fuel that caught fire because it was surrounding the heat sink or because the insulation had frayed. I'm not, I'm not clear on that. But this report is well worth reading. The, the Haddon Cave report on, on the incident is, is, is well worth reading. So uh, the uh, Nimrod was actually developed uh, uh, you know, by BAE. Uh, in, you know, it had been flying since 1969. It had been uh, uh, upgraded with the mid-air refueling in 82 and again in 89. And there, there was a safety case that went with it. The, the safety case was basically this has been flying for 25 years. What's your problem? Okay, that was the argument. And sometimes that's a good argument. Nothing has gone wrong in, in 25 years. Uh, but as a skeptic, how do I find fault to that argument? Okay, it seems to have nothing to do with whether it's safe or not. Okay, just because it's been flying for 25 years isn't, an, isn't a positive argument for safety. It just means you're lucky. Okay. So, uh, Correct, yeah, like that speculative execution. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So um, anyway, the, the Haddon Cave report, you know, it, it minces no words. It's really an outstanding document. It names names. Okay. It, it really just calls out the problem. So here it says that as a matter of good engineering practice, it would be extremely unusual, to put it no higher, to co-locate an exposed source of ignition with a potential source of fuel, unless it was designated a fire zone and provided with commensurate protection. Nevertheless, this is what occurred within the Nimrod. Okay. So the efficient argument that the safety case should have made is that there's only one place that fuel and ignition can possibly interact, and that's the combustion chamber. There's no other way that they can physically interact at all. That's the efficient argument that should have been made. Saying it's been flying for 25 years with, in a completely different context is, is irre irrelevant to the safety. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. Um, so uh, unfortunately, the Nimrod safety case was a lamentable job from start to finish. It was riddled with errors. It missed the key dangers. Its production is a story of incompetence, complacency, and cynicism. The Nimrod safety case process was fatally undermined by a general malaise, a widespread assumption by those involved that the Nimrod was safe anyway because it had successfully flown for 30 years. And the task of drawing up the safety case essentially became essentially a paperwork and tick box exercise. Again, this is what a lot of people do with regulations also. They just say, yeah, been there, done that. Okay. It, it, it's kind of meaningless. Often it's done after the fact, which is not what you need to do. You need to think about it as part of the design process, that you're designing the assurance argument. You're designing why it works, not how it works. So the, uh, a safety case itself is defined as a structured argument supported by a body of evidence that provides a compelling, comprehensible, and valid case that a system is safe for a given application in a given environment. The basic aim, purpose, and underlying philosophy of safety cases were clearly defined, but there was, a limited, there was limited practical guidance as to how, in fact, to go about constructing a safety case. If the Nimrod safety case had been properly carried out, the loss of XV 230 would have been avoided. Again, you, know, you, you can follow the spirit and the letter of these uh, safety cases, but you, you, you still don't know why that has anything to do with the artifact that you design. And this is the, the key point that I'm trying to make, is that you, you, it, it needs to be uh, entirely a, a part of the design process, not something that's done after the fact. So let's go to uh, kind of evidence-based assurance and uh, what, what we can actually do concretely to do this design for, uh, for assurance. So th these uh, two definitions that are given for what a safety case or an assurance case, as we more generally call it, 
is one from Adelard, which has been widely quoted, a, a documented body of evidence that provides a convincing and valid argument that a specified set of critical claims about a system's properties are adequately justified for a given application in a given environment. This is the one that Haddon Cave himself quoted. So I don't know about you, but I read things like this and think, I don't know. You know it, this hasn't added a bit of information to what I might have known before. These are just words. Okay. The, the, it's, it, as Haddon Cave said, it gives you no guidance as to how to create one of these. It's just motherhood and apple pie. The FDA uh, uh, definition is a little more concrete. An assurance case is a formal method for demonstrating the validity of a claim by providing a convincing argument together with supporting evidence. It's a way to structure arguments to help ensure that top-level claims are credible and supported. In an assurance case, many arguments with the supporting evidence may be grouped under one top-level claim. For a complex case, there may be a complex web of arguments. So here on the right, I've shown, you know, for example, that you want to show the software meets its requirements. You can divide that up into models that you have of the operator, the environment in which you expect it to operate, the, the plant and uh, model that you have, the control model. The plant itself can be further decomposed into the physical plant, like the, say it's a self-driving car. The physical plant is the car itself. The sensors that are involved, the LIDAR and radar and cameras and so on, the actuators, the accelerator and the brakes and the steering wheel. Um, you can decompose the control into the uh, architecture and the, the components, as well as the hardware platform on which it runs. So you can have, uh, for example, models of these. You can have theorems about these. You can have test cases that you've established. And so the things that I've shown in, in green are, are actually the ones that, for example, may be supported by empirical evidence rather than formal evidence. But you, you can have probabilistic uh, arguments, you can have uh, formal arguments, and so on. So I'll say a little bit more about this. And there, is some, uh, there are some standards that uh, uh, tell you how to go about building assurance cases for safety-critical systems. And so the, some of these are like from the military, for the automotive industry, um, for the aviation industry. So DO 178C is, is typically the aviation standard for avionics software. And uh, it, it actually is one that uh, advocates, for example, model-based uh, software engineering, formal methods, formal analysis, and so on. So, so these are um, often, they, they're kind of a, a mix of uh, uh, process-based standards as well as product-based standards. That is, you know, have you followed a certain process? Or have you established some particular attribute or property of the product itself? And uh, so in um, the DO 178C, you have these uh, traceability links. So traceability is why, you, uh, for example, some artifact exists. What, what requirement can you trace it back to? Or you know, where is it in this decomposition? And so you, you cannot have anything that isn't traceable all the way back to the requirements, for instance. You can't have extraneous lines of code. If you had them, you should reflect them in a, in a, in a high-level requirement. So you have the software requirements allocate, system requirements allocated to software. Um, so uh, you know, for example, you, you may be uh, controlling a car, but only some part of the uh, requirements are actually allocated to the software and the car itself. The high-level requirements, which can decompose into the architecture and the, soft, the software low-level requirements, you can think of these as the component requirements. And you derive, for example, test cases and test results from, from the software high-level requirements. You, you say this test tests this particular requirement positively or negatively. And then you uh, have the, the software uh, low-level requirements decomposed into source code and eventually executable object code. Okay? And, and uh, so there are traceability links. There are claims associated with these that you have to establish. And lately, there's been a, a current uh, away from this towards something called overarching properties. That is, it's, uh, you, you think of assurance in terms of three uh, legs to a table, intent, correctness, and innocuity. Intent is, are you building the right software? Correctness is, are you building the software right? And innocuity is, is there nothing else in it? So the, yeah. Yeah. 
so yeah, the, the timing predictability is actually an important quality you want uh, on these. So you. Uh, that, so that because the behavior is not predictable for machine learning systems, so what's your solution? Yeah, I'll come to that. I'll I'll come to that. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that's interesting about software that's also weird about software compared to other uh, physical systems, please. From what? Okay. Uh, um, yeah. So the um, it's it's agility is kind of a an orthogonal issue. So there is one um, this way of the thinking about it, the way I presented it, actually suffers from one really large uh, mythical assumption that somehow the customer knows what the requirements for the software are. And uh, agility takes that on in, in the sense that unless you iterate with the customer, you really don't know what the requirements are. But in, in, in safety critical systems, that's not the case. You can pretty much uh, identify the, the requirements fairly precisely. So uh, this, this isn't an issue with, with safety critical systems. There may be uh, other reasons why you want to adopt an agile process, but uh, it, it's not because the requirements are vague. Okay. okay, so software actually admits the possibility of perfection. Software is a mathematical object. We expect hardware to have semantics. We expect programming languages to have semantics. We expect to be able to say that this program actually computes the square root, all, all of these things, we, 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 uh, with, with mathematical precision. So we, we can actually do that. Modulo, the fact that hardware is something that operates in the physical world, there are things, cosmic rays, heat, uh, all kinds, kinds of things that can interfere with these assumptions. But given the, the models that you have, you, you, you can actually get it right. The getting accurate specifications is, is a challenge also. This is something that isn't always easy to do. If you, if you, if you came up to me and said, specify what Word is, you know, the Microsoft Word, I can't write a specification for Word. I actually don't know. It does what it does. There's a great book by uh, Daniel Jackson, uh, whose name I forget, but it's something about uh, software and design. Um, in that, he points out like a lot of the things that uh, I find annoying, like Gmail and so on. Um, he points out that they, they are doing, they, they've been programmed to do what they were expected to do. There's nothing wrong. It's just the specifications are wrong. The, the programs are actually implementing a specification. It just happens to be the wrong specification. And, and I look at Gmail and think, this is mystifying. Who thought of something like this? Okay. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, apparently what they wanted to do. They, they built what they wanted to build. It's just as bizarre. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so the, the uh, main, main point here is that modulo these assumptions, you can actually get everything exactly, exactly right. And this is actually feasible to do. That, uh, you know, there, there are many examples of this that people have done. Uh, I, I list a few, and uh, uh, actually Jonathan's talk is also right at the bottom here, Everest. This, these are in my slides. I didn't add them for Jonathan's benefit. This has been in my slides uh, prior to this. So uh, the, uh, you know, the, the many things actually, the, um, for me, the watershed uh, achievement and verification is actually the CLI stack. The first thing out there in 1989, they verified a processor, uh, uh, assembler, a compiler for a reasonably high-level language, and an operating system kernel um, in uh, uh, a system that predates ACL2 called NQTHUM. So that's something that uh, was... was uh, done quite early. And there have been many other, uh, PVS, for example, has been used for air traffic collision algorithms for a separation kernel. Actually, a number of compilers, hardware processors have been verified with that. And these are uh, 
big examples, complex examples. And uh, going back to Abhik's point about the, the training that's needed to do this, obviously you can't do this without adequate training. But once you have well-trained people, it is actually more productive to use formal techniques than do it by trial and error. That is, it'll save you cost, it'll save you time, it'll save you money to do it with formal methods. And this has been true for decades. Okay. The bottleneck is we don't have the trained manpower. Carlo. Please. Uh, the, uh, all the examples, or at least some of the examples you gave us of failures, were mainly, uh, you know, requirements. They, they were wrong. Yeah. Uh, so it was not the software Correct. which yeah. had a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, but that software has been developed probably not using formal methods. Indeed, yeah. This is correct, yeah. So the, the, uh, in, in avionics especially, uh, they, they don't have coding errors. So the problem is elsewhere. Yeah, the, the, this is it. The, 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 the bottleneck is not formal methods. It's actually design. So you, you, you're, uh, sorry, by design you also include? Uh, include requirements, requirements. absolutely, yeah. Understanding the environment. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's design, okay. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's shocking that you know, I have to tell you what design is, but we use a lot of words for which we don't have a, a, a widely understood uh, sense of what they mean. So for me, a design is about what stays fixed and what is allowed to vary, and what the time scale of that variation is. Okay, that's what design is. Why is it, so, so it's the combination of structure, semantics, and, and, and dynamics. And uh, so, if you don't have something that's fixed, you don't have any semantics. Things can just interact in any which way they want. So what you fix is actually extremely important because that's what gives you semantics. But if you don't allow things to vary, you don't have any interesting behavior. You just designed a thing that does one thing. It, it maybe it flashes a red light every time you push a button or something like that. You, know, you need to have some variation for it to be an interesting uh, artifact. So it's this combination of uh, you know, what you fix and what you're allowed to vary that is design. And a lot of what I'm telling you, you know, it, it, it sounds like something perhaps you've never heard before. I can't make the meaning that clear to you because you have to live the experience. You have to consciously pay attention to what you fix and what you're allowed to vary for you to understand what that means. Okay. So these are things that you, you, by telling you this is not going to help you with your education. You have to live it. To, to, you have to consciously pay attention to what is, is observed out here for you to actually understand the import of it. And in particular, the, the design for something that's a safety critical system should, should basically include things like the uh, uh, reason why the design meets its objectives. And that includes the requirements. So what's an argument? Okay, that's, that's another thing I have to tell you about. And uh, this is a, a, a rich subject by itself. You could, you could actually work on this for uh, a, a dissertation and so on. The, the, um, in fact, this is a field of study called uh, critical studies or something like that. They look at arguments and see how they can be flawed. But for our purpose here, an argument is a, is a, is a tree of claims and subclaims and assumptions. And the, the key point is the, the decomposition of claims to subclaims and assumptions must be accompanied by theory. There must be some reason why you accept that refinement of, of a, a goal or a claim into subgoals or subclaims. So there must be some accepted theory that goes with it. There must be a theory, for instance, why testing gives you adequate confidence that your requirements are in fact valid, for instance. Okay, so things like that uh, are how you, you uh, gain confidence that something is, is, is uh, acceptable as an argument. And so this theory itself should be accompanied by evidence. It's, you know, we have evidence why this way of testing a medical device, for instance, is effective. And uh, the 
uh, refinement could also involve probabilistic and logical uh, steps. And the assumptions, again, you, know, you need to have uh, evidence supporting them. If you, if you assume, for example, that this works in a certain temperature range or it, it works with uh, uh, a, a certain uh, assumption on, on the arrangement of uh, traffic, for instance, the, the way lanes are organized, all of those should be built into the, the uh, assumptions there together with evidence why this is a reasonable assumption. So now we get to how you, how you make an argument like that efficient. And uh, so here, uh, Sidney Harris's cartoon, uh, that's an example of an inefficient argument. That's the, the argument that the uh, Nimrod uh, safety case was making. You want proof, I'll give you proof. So the, uh, an efficient argument is not that. An efficient argument is one that actually takes the uh, skeptic seriously and makes life easier for the skeptic. It expands the falsification space. It says, you don't have to check whether my program is type correct. You can find a flaw in the type checker that I'm using. Okay, you, you know, that's, that's expanded the falsification space. If, if you find any flaw in the type checker, even one that isn't relevant to my program, I'll accept defeat. Okay, so the person making the argument to the skeptic is willing to accept defeat on the flimsiest of grounds. That's what makes an argument efficient. And so when you design, and this is not... I'm, I'm making these observations, but it's not like this is a novel concept. This is how we design stuff. This is why we have the ecosystem that we have. It's for creating efficient argument-based designs. Okay, and, and so you end up with this lower amortized cost, even though proving type system sound might be extra work. It may not be relevant to the particular program you're writing and so on. It's still worth it because it, it reduces the amortized cost. And on, on the other hand, an inefficient argument would be one where you, you see claims that are not verifiable. You know, the, the, it says things like this, uh, um, the, the, the software is good, or we used uh, Agile, for instance. I mean, that, that has a, no bearing on, on any of these things. It's an imprecise claim. Okay, so unfalsifiable assumptions, complex uh, chains of reasoning, all of these things make uh, the arguments inefficient. Okay, so how do we design for efficient arguments? And I'll give you a few examples, and then I'll stop. Okay, so here again is another Sidney Harris cartoon. The, you know, then a miracle occurs. So again, this is another source of inefficiency. So the the uh, efficient arguments, as I pointed out, use precise claims, valid models and assumptions, things that are supported by evidence, reusable design tools and artifacts, things that are widely used and trusted, an architectural separation of concerns, and rigorous chains of reasoning and evidence. And you want all this to be watertight and, and wrapped in a, in a workflow where the uh, connection between the reasoning and the evidence and the real artifact don't have any gaps in them. So if you think of this as a, a table with four legs and a surface on top. The four legs of an efficient argument are models, tools, language, and architecture. The uh, thing that connects all these together is a shared ontology, so that when you make claims, it's pre pretty clear precisely what you're talking about. That's the ontology, and there's no confusion in the ontology between the language, the models, the tools, and the architecture. So the, these are things that are uh, operating on a, on a shared language. So the, the uh, models that you use are quite important. You can have lots of uh, models out there of the environment, the plant, the, the failure models, the models of sensors, actuators, the hardware platform. All of these are models. And the advantage of using models is that you've identified all of the, uh, or, or hopefully a broad range of contexts in which the software works. So that way you can plug and play different contexts and the software can still work and you can reuse the argument. So again, it reduces the amortized cost, gives you efficiency. So this is the money slide. So this is the kind of key uh, uh, checklist of things that uh, you can do to design for efficiency. So the, the first is making sure that you have an assurance-driven workflow that is operating continuously. It's telling you where there's missing evidence, there's uh, claims that uh, need to be justified and, and that ensures that the evidence is, is tied to the artifacts that you, you've constructed. The second is, is property-based assurance, that 
it's not that there's anything wrong with process. It's actually important to use process as well. But a property-based assurance can tell you that, for example, this software has no runtime errors in it. That, that's important to know, that they, they, you, you don't have to worry about runtime errors in the software. So that way, if, if, if something fails in the software, it, it's based to some, some failure of a specific property in the software, not because something was wrong with the process. So the uh, use of architecture I've already emphasized. It's based on a rigorous model of computation with semantics. It's this thing that stays fixed but allows other things to vary. It's the separation of the logical and physical architecture. This is something that's rarely done, even though it's quite important. That is, you need to build your software to work against a logical architecture so that the physical uh, architecture can be allowed to vary. There can be multiple physical architectures on, on which it can be deployed. And, and this factors the work. That way, you can prove the correctness of the, the, you can prove the requirements relative to this logical architecture assumptions. And later on, you can show that the physical architecture does meet those assumptions. And that claim of the physical architecture meeting the logical architecture assumptions is highly reusable. You don't have to repeatedly do that for each instance. So then you have com component contract specifications. One of the things that the architecture should do for you is turn the temporal behavior of the software into the pre-post condition contract on, on the component software. So that's what you expect the software to do. Because the components are essentially operating on kind of a per request basis, or they're operating uh, on a cycle. And so if you can reduce, if your architecture can reduce temporal to pre-post condition, that's given you a, a, a big leap. It's one of those refinement steps in the argument. Uh, using abstract component models, that, that way you can plug and play the components, you can enrich the components, you can refine the components as you go along. Using uh, static analysis for generic properties, that's making sure, for example, there are no memory uh, type safety errors, uh, no runtime um, uh, failures, and so on. So all of these are generic properties you want all software to have. So you want to be able to uh, employ static analysis for those. Then the, the, I introduced this thing called ontic type analysis which is something we don't do. We, we, our types are about uh, how the data is represented and what uh, operations are legal on, on, on data. It's not about what the data actually represents. But you can have quite nice type systems about what the data represents. So integers, for instance, can be used to represent everything from uh, age to uh, social security number to user ID to uh, IP addresses. Not all of them uh, support all the operations on integers. Not all, all of these things make sense. You wouldn't think of adding two user IDs together. That's not a sensible operation. So an ontic type distinction on, on that integer representation would meaningfully tell you that this is a user ID. You could go further than that. Nothing in, in, in a user ID tells you whether it's authenticated or not. That's implicitly a property of that user ID having gone through authentication. So an ontic type that tells you whether this has been authenticated or not is helpful there, because you can make sure that certain operations can only be performed by authenticated users. And so there's a long list of these ontic types that I'll get to. In what sense? Yeah, so uh, the, the one kind of slightly awkward way of uh, realizing this is to use, uh, you can use abstract data types, objects, and so on to uh, uh, essentially uh, hide the representation. But what that masks is that the same uh, 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 data value can have many ontic attributes. And, and that's where it gets awkward to use object-oriented programming. So something, for example, could be uh, a key. It could be a session key. It could be a private key. It could be a public key. Uh, you know, uh, making all those ontic distinctions gets awkward. So, so using object-oriented uh, as a first level of approximation to ontic types, or traits, for instance, as a first level of approximation, is fine. But 
you really do need a ontic type system to capture this. And uh, so. It's it's the the, the fact that uh, it could it could belong to many different ontic uh, categories ontic attributes so simultaneously, yeah that's why. I, I don't know anything about the phrase very well. Yeah, we used to be at least like a, we used to use MATLAB. In yeah. MATLAB you 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 have um, I don't know which one. So you can add a, a scalar to a vector, which is okay. Yeah. But because this one, and I imagine that. That's, that's the kind of thing you want to rule out. I mean, you want to, for example, uh, dimensions are an ontic uh, attribute. Uh, you can, you can uh, check for dimensions. And uh, you, interesting, you bring up MATLAB. A lot of their tutorial examples have dimensional flaws in them. And no one notices this. They, they, they uh, confuse. No. It is, yeah. It is, yeah. That's that's definitely what, uh, at least for safety critical systems, you don't want that. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, code generators is another thing out there. So, uh, how much time do I have left, Jens? Okay. Okay. So, uh, again, feel free to ask questions. The the rest of the talk is. Uh, uh, just fleshing out the points I made so far. Wait, uh, let, let him uh, first. Uh. So I was wondering about um, why software systems like compilers and <coughs> you might have uh, linear compilers. Yeah. Uh, more than one has to do for some reason. Yeah. So how can you link uh, some of these systems with uh, still linear types? So, so some, some of the things like the static analysis and so on can be done quite rapidly. One of the advantages of doing things compositionally is that it's incremental. You, you only need to check the diffs. You don't need to check the million lines of code uh, in, in a whole program way. So. But, but for example, modeling or something like that, everybody can do it. Yeah, the, the, it should be a continuous integration. As, as commits show up, you need to make sure that the claims are restored. You, you, you need to, and, and some of this can be done offline. It doesn't have to be done uh, instantaneously, but you do need to make sure that the the assurance uh, claims are are done as part of the design process, and and you can see where the gaps are. You can fill the gaps. You can uh, make sure that uh, the 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 argument is actually converging to some to to QED basically. Yeah, Abhi. Indeed, yeah. That they are monolithically available, yeah. which is uh, often not the case. And Absolutely, yeah. The supply chain security issue that you mentioned, that also comes from that, that even in safety critical systems, there might be vendor provided software that is used because you kind of try to provide a new version of a vendor provided code, which has a component. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention this. So Indeed. All of this is certainly, I really have no issues with this, but there is a very strong simplifying assumption, yeah. which does not hold our main point. Yeah, so the, this, uh, one thing here is that it, it doesn't mean that your requirements need to be static. You, yeah. can, you can have varying requirements. You can have requirements that you've discovered as part of the testing process, for instance, or requirements that you found were incorrect. And actually writing these out, we, even something simple, we took an exercise of a, a, a drone going on a mission. And GPS can fail, the uh, IMU 
can fail, uh, you know, all, all of these things can go wrong. And what you do in, in reaction to this failure is quite complicated. The, the main requirement you want is that you can retrieve the drone if something happened, actually. The, it's a physical requirement. It's not, nothing to do with the software. But the software is actually governed by that requirement. That means you need to make sure that if it's going to land, it's going to land close to where its last signal was. And uh, so, so writing these, uh, actually, writing the requirements is probably as hard as doing the design. Managing that, yeah. I am completely That's right, yeah. That That's right. The truth is that this is almost the difference between debugging and verification. Debugging yeah. is a very challenging problem because of the specification. Indeed, yeah. So uh, a lot of what we find even when we're formalizing things is the very act of formalization reveals a whole bunch of ambiguity and um, imprecision. So, so that alone is a, even if you didn't do proofs, just formalizing it reveals a lot of issues. Okay, so one thing that's uh, important out here is how you think about this kind of property-directed verification. And uh, in this, I've, I've introduced something called the eight variables model. So this uh, builds on something that uh, David Parnas introduced called the four variables model. And the eight variables model, you have a, oops, you have a pose that is the uh, uh, physical state of the plant. The plant is what you're controlling under a certain environment and you are able to monitor certain physical variables and turn them into digital inputs to the controller. The controller also gets inputs from the operator in terms of uh, I mean, uh, commands and is able to turn that into an output to the actuator that then uh, turns into a physical variable that's controlled. So these eight variables, the top four variables are physical, the bottom four ones are digital. Um, the uh, inner ones are uh, Parnas's original variables, control, monitored, input, and output. Those are the internal variables. The outer ones are where the, the, the external variables and the requirements are really in, in terms of these outer variables. Okay. And uh, so the, the point of doing this is to, is to really separate out what are the possible interactions in the system and what interactions shouldn't be there. So, so that's, that's the crucial thing. And then you can build models of the plant, you can build models of the actuator, sensor, operator, and then you can design the controller to make sure that the pose is safe. Okay, I'll skip this, yeah. Please, Carlo. It's similar, yeah. It's a, it's a little more refined than, yeah. 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 Well, it's, your implies is actually in case, right? Because you don't want anything false there. Correct. That's correct, yeah. That's right. Okay, I'll, I'll skip the example of this. The, the next thing is, the next level of refinement in this, diving into the controller a bit, is the, is the architecture. So here we, uh, just as an example of something that can play into an efficient argument, I give the example of uh, Radler. So the, the Radler system is, you can think of it as a distributed system with uh, nodes and, and topics. And the nodes operate periodically and communicate on channels that are bounded latency. That's all you need to know about it, that you have a distributed system with a fixed collection of nodes each node can uh, subscribe to some topics. It can publish on certain topics. Each topic has exactly one publisher. And uh, the, the nodes operate periodically at their own periods, actually quasi-periodically between a min and max period, and communicate with bounded latency with the other. That's each link between a publisher and a subscriber has its own bounded latency. So that's the logical architecture. The physical architecture clearly has to be verified to meet this logical architecture. But once you do this, you get a whole bunch of guarantees for free. You get, for example, uh, message ordering messages. You can make sure that messages are received in the order sent. You can make sure that there's bounded consecutive message loss. You can even bring it down to zero with uh, a few timing tweaks. You can make sure that there are end-to-end -end latency bounds, that is, between the time you press the brakes and 
when the car stops, you can make sure that that time is bounded. You can make sure that if these assumptions are violated, you can actually monitor the system to see if the latency bounds are being met. For example, if the platform has, has some failure in it, you can then definitely uh, observe it and flag it. That's the nice thing about having semantics is that you can monitor for whether the semantics are being respected. Because it's periodic, you can't have any denial of service attacks. And this is actually a problem when people uh, naively design event-based systems. You cannot build an event-based system that's protected against denial of service attacks. The semantics makes it impossible. You have to respond to every event. And that means somebody can really flood you with events, and then you're, you're going to have a denial of service attack. Here, you, you just fill up your mailbox if you, if you keep publishing too rapidly. All you do is overwrite your mailbox. The, the person at the subscribing end is, is not perturbed by it at all. They're going to process your message at their period. And so there's no possible denial of service attack. You get things like uh, partitioning, the absence of infiltration, exfiltration, all of these from the, the way the architecture is designed. So a lot of guarantees now are at this uh, reusable level of the architecture. You don't have to worry about what the components do. You can have components as bad as they can be. No, there are uh, ways of uh, provisioning things so that you can get it, but uh, not, yeah, not generally. Actually, you can't even run it on like a Wi-Fi network. The, the latency bounds on a Wi-Fi network are pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. So, but the, I would say that this is a sufficient architecture for 90% of the cyber physical systems that are being built. Things, buildings, electric grids, so you can. Um, cars, planes, all of them can operate with this model. So the, the kind of more extreme version of this model is what's called the replicated state machine model, where everything is operating at the same clock and synchronizing round by round. I think that is too heavy. That, that model also came out of SRI, but that's too heavy a model for uh, most applications. This is a lighter model that gives you uh, similar guarantees. Okay, and, and then you can actually then structure the argument in a nice, uh, well-factored way to, to make sure that uh, everything is, is uh, giving you the claims that, that you want in, in, a, in a reusable way, so that you know, all of these claims and subclaims are actually reusable across many, many different instances of this architecture. Okay, I'll, I'll skip ontology. The, um, it's, it's important, but I'll, I'll have to skip it. Uh, I mentioned uh, ONTIC type analysis, so uh, things that you can uh, get with this, uh, um, I mean, for example, integers you can represent, uh, I mean, even the distinction between airspeed and ground speed, even though they're both speed, they may be represented in the same uh, di dimensions and unit seven. That distinction is important, because you, if you confuse those two, and I believe when you look at a lot of software, there is this kind of confusion. Just because they're both speed, you, you uh, end up with this confusion. Actually, another instance where we found a lot of units errors is that in MATLAB, the time step is often one. So people have confusion between velocity and acceleration, and they never notice it because that time step is one. Okay. So, so this is, again, uh, a, a, a significant source of uh, actual error because if you tweak the time step to point nine, everything will fall apart. One really important one is taint. To be able to track taint is, is, is really important. You need to know which things actually are controlled by the user. And you want to make sure that you identified which operations are sensitive, that user data shouldn't reach sensitive operations uh, without being sanitized. So that's really important. Many, many uh, vulnerabilities are because of uh, improper taint tracking, improper provenance tracking. So there are many qualities that can be captured by these uh, uh, ONTIC types, and you can make sure that these vulnerabilities actually don't uh, show up. Yeah. 
And yet omission learning has led to PDR in this one level of research and presents to the next one which doesn't look for it yet. That's right, yeah. So, so th th those are things that uh, you have to make conscious exceptions for. And there's another way in which it's restrictive. That is, take taint, for example. There, there may be operations that you're executing that uh, are used internally and are safe and are accessible externally and are unsafe. And you have to actually provide two different APIs for those. So you have to actually clone the code so that you don't confuse the two. And one you have to sanitize, the other you don't. So you need to do things like that. You need to actually duplicate the code in order to take advantage of this. You need to be able to make certain exceptions. That is, you'll have an operation that actually does the casting that you trust in order to do this. So this config type analysis is a kind of a type checking that you perform on the code based on the types that you define at the uh, get -to That's right. Yeah, you, you, you specify, for example, the, the uh, pre and post conditions, on tick pre and post conditions. Yeah. That's right. And you can do type checking by using this checking. That's right. For example, for, for taint, you'll say that this uh, SQLite, the, it, it expects the, uh, this uh, SQL statement to be untainted. And you'll say that the only thing that can convert taint into untainted is, is the sanitizer. That's the only operation that can do it. And anything that's red is tainted automatically. So there, there have been, again, uh, historically many, many uh, uh, places where ontic types have been used, most prominently in something called type state. Type state is a fairly popular uh, mechanism for this. Then uh, you know, code generation is, is, a, is another kind of source of efficiency. Actually, doing proofs is another source of efficiency. Uh, so in, in PVS, you can uh, do these. Pre PVS is now more than 30 years old. It's, a, it's, a, it's been around for a while. But uh, you could always do proofs like this. You can uh, prove, for instance, the sum of squares, sum of cubes, sum of uh, fourth powers, and so on. These are all one-liners. You wouldn't even notice. Um, actually, I, I can show you a brief demo if you want. Um, So, so this is the summation, for instance, and you can prove this. And uh, this is proved by a command called induct and simplify. And uh, so you can prove all of these. You can prove uh, sum of squares. All the way to sum of fourth powers, for instance. Oh, one thing about ontic types is that you, you want them to be carried through. Sure. You, 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 you uh, want them to go from requirements all the way down to the... Um, and, and some ontic types you might introduce as you're refining things. That is, uh, in particular, you might want to distinguish that this is an index into this array. So there are some internal ontic types also. By the way, the meaning of ontic is... Uh, I hope I'm using it correctly, but it, it uh, pertains to physical existence. Okay, so it's, it's a thing that you're talking about the attributes of some physical thing, and uh, that's kind of where it comes from. So that's why I use it. Okay. In fact, another example I have here is the, uh, Terry Tao actually posted a blog thing, and uh, I, I did this in PVS, and uh, I'm not sure why he wrote a blog about it, but it, it's a exercise you wouldn't even notice if you were doing it would be something that is uh, yeah, on, on the way to something bigger. It's, it's, a, it's a really easy theorem. In fact, I can show you the, this is the main lemma actually that uh, we have out here. So, let's see where, oops. do I not have it here? Okay, it is not responding to me. this again. Okay. And so this is a bunch of steps, but you just kind of go through them and you can see the 
structure. You can actually visualize the proof as well. So, uh, so it's just one induction, and, and you finish the proof. And then the main theorem follows as a, as a kind of corollary to the thing. So the, this, this whole exercise took me like five minutes. It's, it's a very modest exercise. You can, you can prove very, very big things. Um, and it doesn't take long. Actually, proof is not the bottleneck at all. Okay. It's, it's having people who are good at doing it is a bottleneck, but proof is not a bottleneck. It's, it's as I said, been a simple thing to do for a very long time. Okay. Uh, let me wrap up. Okay, I wanted to say a little bit about AI when, uh, while we're at it. Um, so, uh, so this is an old paper that came out uh, in 2018. Uh, I don't know if many of you have seen this, but it's a cute illustration of something where uh, you, you can put an elephant picture. In some contexts, it gets recognized. So for example, it's, it's there in all the pictures, but it only gets recognized in the third one above. But it affects other things also. It, the, the, the cup, the little uh, blue, blue square, uh, blue rectangle out here, the cup actually d disappears depending on where the elephant is. A couch gets turned, in, a chair gets turned into a couch. So lots of things go wrong. So this is, again, not a new concern. Uh, uh, the concern for AI safety has been there all along. McCarthy, actually, uh, my postdoctoral advisor, wanted uh, uh, you know, the reason he created LISP and so on was, was to be able to uh, reason about things, uh, including what the AI was doing. And um, so he, he wanted uh, systems to be able to learn reflectively from being able to examine their own rules. And uh, there, there's been a long history of work in verifying AI algorithms, planning algorithms, and so on. And in many cases, what we're dealing with with machine learning is, is I don't think, a hugely new problem. We've already had to deal with it with sensors. Because sensors also are able to, uh, are kind of giving you approximations to ground truth, and you, you you don't know whether to trust them or not, and so you do certain things to protect against lying sensors. Okay, so the same thing you need to do with uh, some of the AI components as well. So the the uh, I've listed a bunch of things you could do about it. Okay, you can use uh, AI within a, a safe envelope. That's that's one all the way to kind of making sure that you use AI only within human judgment. Okay? That is, you use it to assist human judgment. And I think there, there are actually many uh, situations where that ought to be the case. So, so, but in between, there are a number of things you can do. OK, so summing up, design you know, is, is really the bottleneck in, in all of this. The, the reason we operate with code is it's the only thing that we can really iterate our, our design process on right now. We don't have the tools and artifacts necessary to make uh, the kind of more model-based design a, a reality, but I think that's something that some of you should uh, look at. When it comes to talk about efficiency, it's very easy to kind of say that it's like pornography. You can recognize it when you see it, or you can say that it's more or less efficient, but we need a, a metric to measure efficiency, and that can only come from actually having more experience and more data. And then uh, you know, we uh, have to be able to make formal methods more uh, widely usable and accessible in order to be part of it. And, and by this, I mean a range of, uh, range of formal methods that uh, go from, uh, for example, lightweight static analysis tools, uh, formally verified architectures, all the way to uh, uh, fully fully certified code and in in doing this you know we, we have to recognize that software is important a lot of our, uh, ground truth is actually uh, reliant on software code is not a good way to represent design what we need is really code that we can uh, coming out that we can trust uh, the code that goes into the ecosystem should be stuff that is is accompanied by trust. Just like when you open the tap, you know that it's drinkable water. Okay, you know it because there's a whole ecosystem of trust built around that. 
it should be the same with software. Because you can't, I mean, everyone can't be testing the software before they use it or testing the water before they drink it. And so we need to uh, take the information that we're representing in software seriously, take requirements seriously, as I said, many flaws really go f stem from bad requirements, take architecture seriously, take composable evidence seriously. That's what we should be exchanging. When, you, when I buy software from you, I'm not just buying the software, I'm buying why it works, the, the assurance argument. Take runtime monitoring. This is something, again, that's important because you need to uh, make sure that things are working uh, with the, the assumptions that you had in mind. Get, the, get rid of these original sins. Build these uh, watertight workflows. And actually integrate uh, attestation uh, into things so that you get signed qualities associated with software. So what, what you end up with then is a software proof of virtues. People have this notion of a software bill of materials. Again, I think this is a, that is a CYA thing. I think what you need is a software proof of virtues. Okay, and we can do this. I think we can do this and get to a point where we, we are not only bestowing a lot of trust in software, but we've done it in a way that's generating real economy. We're saving trillions of dollars that we can use to solve mankind's other problems. Thank you.